US China relations under Biden administration implications for India as you know later today Joe Biden will be sworn in as the 46th US president so transition will be completed the topic we have selected for today is one of the most important questions being debated and to explore this subject we have with us two very distinguished speakers ambassador arun singh former ambassador of india to the usa france and israel who is now teaching at ashoka university among his other affiliations we also have anand krishnan china correspondent of the hindu welcome arun welcome anand thank you we have the print as a media partner for this seminar there are several strands in chinese thinking that we can discern from our interactions with the chinese strategic community and comment commentaries emanating from china there is a measure of consensus that china's relations with the usa have changed fundamentally under the trump administration and that under biden to strategic competition rivalry will continue there is in fact no real expectation of return to amicable engagement with an element of competition that characterized sino us relations under the obama administration there are some who argue that usa will be preoccupied with the covid pandemic and domestic differences including a polarization that arun ref referred to in a in a very perceptive op-ed piece in indian express this morning uh you know it suggested that there'll be only limited appetite in view of these preoccupations to wage an aggressive strategic offensive vis-a-vis -vis china however there is recognition in china that trump's policy of treating china as a strategic rival which needs to be countered and contained has bipartisan support including in the us congress and is likely to outlast trump in his confirmation hearing yesterday secretary of state designate antony blinken agreed with gop senators that previous optimistic approaches to china were flawed and backed the tougher approach adopted by the trump administration he also supported his predecessor or the current secretary of state mike pompeo's finding that china has committed genocide in xinjiang he used in fact on china language uh, uh, and formulations quite tough in character at the same time you know there is a view uh, both in china as also in the usa that the us under biden will be less confrontational and unpredictable compared to the trump period when it comes to china policy it's being hoped in china that biden will be more inclined to explore areas of convergent interests like climate change as blinken also suggested yesterday in his congressional testimony there is nevertheless apprehension in china that biden might be more effective in countering china as he eschews trump's unilateral policies which targeted us allies as well and instead work with allies and develop coherent coalitions targeting china implications or indications are that china might seek to dial down tensions in its relations without in any way lowering its strategic ambitions this afternoon uh, our speakers will be exploring several questions let me know highlight the three set of questions that i believe arun and anand will be addressing one would a biden administration build further on the trump era characterization of china as a rival and a challenge or would it be conditioned more by the search for common ground on climate change arms control and global economic revitalization or would it be a mix of the two this is first set of questions secondly how is china viewing the change in the usa does china expect an easing of the tensions that marked relations with the trump, trump administration or is it preparing for the prospect of a more effective american response predicated on a more coherent strategy involving us allies and partners thirdly what impact will the changing us china dynamic 
have on india china relations at a time when numerous numerous commentators in china are situating recent tensions with india against the backdrop of a closer india us strategic partnership uh, before uh, i invite uh, arun and anand to speak and address these questions uh, let me explain some ground rules uh, arun and anand have indicated that they'll be speaking for about 35 40 minutes then we'll mute all other participants we'll thereafter have the q and a session for about 30 minutes you may indicate your interest in asking questions by using the raise hand option available at the bottom of the list of participants questions can also be sent to me through the chat option i'll call on the participants to ask their questions the concerned participant will unmute himself or herself other participants are requested to keep themselves muted i'll now invite ambassador arun singh to offer his remarks uh, arun is one of our most perceptive observers of issues relating to usa and we are all looking forward to hearing arun's views on us china relations and the biden presidency arun over to you well uh, thank you thank you ashok uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, discussion and uh, for your very comprehensive uh, introduction Uh, i must congratulate you for uh, the timing of your uh, selection for this discussion because as you mentioned uh, joe biden takes over later today as the uh, 46th president but even more than that so far many of us were speculating writing on what a biden administration would mean for us china relation and therefore implications uh, for india and much of that to some extent was uh, based on informed analysis Uh, some speculation going by our interactions by officials in the uh, obama biden administration who we expected to be there in as part of the biden harris administration going by analysis of what they have been writing since and commenting uh, but as you indicated yesterday many of them took formal positions as part of the senate confirmations and therefore the manner in which they will navigate the new phase in the relationship with china at least as for as of now there was some indication and if you looked at the comments of not just the secretary of state designate uh, blinken but also the defense secretary designate uh, austin uh, the uh, uh, director of national intelligence uh, designate avril haines the broad message that came out related to china is that they see china as a very important rival Uh, perhaps they see china as the principal rival going ahead because uh, austin characterized russia as declining in its ability to challenge the united states and can still challenge militarily not in other domains but china having the capacity and increasing capacity to challenge the united states across a range of sectors uh, china's uh, model was described as authoritarian the challenge to us values and as you mentioned um the um, designation by pompeo of chinese actions in Geno in xinjiang as genocide uh, was supported by blinken but way back in august when a similar question had been posed to um, uh, candidate biden uh, when there were some reports that this designation was being considered uh, through a spokesman he had indicated that he would support uh, this uh, designation uh, and avril hens in her testimony said that uh, the way they handled china pre trump was based on situation then the situation now is very very different and in her testimony the treasury secretary does in janet yellen uh, described uh, chinese economic practices in very negative terms uh, predatory economic practices intellectual property uh, theft of forced technology transfers so it's a, a new uh, approach if we compare it to the time of the obama biden administration now will this endure is this uh, just the initial phase what would be the difference between the trump approach and the biden approach i think we can understand that if we look at the evolution of the us china relationship uh, in a more historical context uh, and then see what the trump administration did and therefore what are going to be the compulsions uh, for the biden administration now we all recall that the new phase in a sense of the relationship with china was started way back in 1971 when henry kissinger made a secret trip through pakistan before that he came to india didn't say anything and suddenly vanished while he was in pakistan and that was a part of their attempt 
to sharpen the Sino-Soviet split in the global balance uh, of power. And uh, during the 1971 conflict that we had with Pakistan, in terms of Kissinger's memoirs and the declassified documents, it is clear that one of the reasons they came down completely on support of Pakistan was because they wanted to signal to China that as you build this new relationship with the United States, you will find the United States stands with his partners and allies. And so that was one of the dimensions that had come in. Uh, 1971 onwards, the new phase of engagement uh, with China started uh, for the US. Uh, in 1989, uh, when the Tiananmen incident happened, uh, the United States, uh, despite the gross violation of human rights, looked at the broader dimension of the relationship. There were some minor sanctions, but the approach of engagement with China was sustained. Uh, after a while, the US worked for China's entry into World Trade Organization and worked to grant China permanent normal trading relations status, which was something earlier was being done on a, an annual basis as a way of sustaining pressure on China related to some of its domestic policies, economic policies, issues related to human rights. But once the permanent uh, normal trading relations status was given, that pressure uh, went off. Of course, this was supported by US business, which wanted a more uh, predictable regime in the relationship with China. You may recall the then US Vice President, uh, Mondale, during a visit to China in 1979, said that the rise of China is in US interest. Now, this is a language that the US uses very often related to India. Uh, now, in 1984, President Reagan issued the National Security Decision Directive 120, just before the visit of Chinese Prime Minister Zhao Xi'an. And in that, it was said that the US seeks a strong, secure and stable China that can be an increasing force for peace, both in Asia and the world. In uh, 1979, when uh, Deng Xiaoping had visited the US, the two agreed to establish a joint intelligence station in Northwest China. It was called Operation Chestnut, and part of the idea was to keep an eye uh, on the uh, Soviet Union. In 1981, President Reagan allowed sale of air, ground, naval, and missile technology uh, to China. Uh, at that time, technology transfers to China were given on generous terms. Uh, China was given preferential trade and investment access. Vast educational exchanges were promoted. And currently, there are more than 400,000 Chinese students in the United States one third of all foreign students in the US is Chinese. And that of course generates a certain pressure on the US educational system, which is looking at sources of funding uh, for themselves. And as everyone knows, China has used this access uh, to pick up technology and other aspects of information uh, from the US system. The United States also supported at that time development financing for China through the World Bank, through the Asian Development Bank, and uh, starting 1981, China started getting those loans. And as of today, China has got more than $60 billion uh, worth of loans uh, from multilateral financing uh, institutions. In 1981, Reagan also authorized peaceful nuclear cooperation to boost China's civil nuclear program. He loosened, loosened in 83, uh, control on export of technology to China. Uh, in 1986, uh, they authorized the establishment of research efforts in many cutting edge areas. That year, the US also started something called the Peace Pearl Program to modernize China's F-8 jet fighters. So that was the broad uh, approach to China uh, at that time. Now it gradually uh, began to change uh, from the time of the Bush administration. Uh, because even during the Clinton administration, uh, the uh, attempt was to involve China more and more into what was described as the international mainstream. Uh, and as you know, China, Clinton had worked for China's entry in the WTO. Uh, and the whole argument was that engagement would lead to political and economic liberalization in China. You may have noticed that in the uh, hearing that was done for the director of national intelligence yesterday, the uh, ranking member in the Senate who will now become chair of the Senate Intelligence Com Committee, Mark Warner, said that he was one of those who had argued 
that engagement would lead to liberalization, but that he has now realized that that was a mistake and that the US now needs uh, to follow a broad policy. So from the time of the Bush administration, there was a gradual sense that China was emerging as a challenge, but still not a complete uh, change in policy or approach. And a leading member of the Bush administration at that time, Bob Zelig, for example, uh, put it in terms of they would like China to have a responsible uh, stakeholder approach, taking into account China's growing power and its desire for a greater international role while deflecting Chinese pressure to replace the US-led international system. So still an effort to cooperate, to accommodate, but try and maintain uh, the US uh, primacy. The Obama administration, when it came in, again started with mixed signals. Uh, in the beginning, the messaging was, including in various private conversations, that they would want to give strategic reassurance to China, that the US believed that it can accommodate in a harmonious manner the rise of China, the two countries could take care of each other's uh, interests, and it could be a cooperative relationship. Uh, in 2009, for example, President Bush had visited uh, China. And in the joint statement uh, that was issued, uh, there was a reference to the two countries also working together uh, in South Asia. Now, that's something that was completely not acceptable uh, to India. Uh, however, since then, there has been no such reference in any US-China joint statement of working together in South Asia. But in that joint statement, there was also a reference that each would be sensitive uh, the both countries would be sensitive to each other's core interests, and on that basis, they could build a stable relationship. Similar sentiments were also expressed uh, when Chinese President Hu Jintao visited the United States uh, in uh, 1981. But by the second phase of the Obama administration, uh, I think the terminology began to change. They began to see China as less cooperative, more a threat to themselves. And the concept that was articulated was that the US now needed to do a pivot to Asia. And therefore that the US needed to remove some of its resources from Europe, from West Asia, and focus its efforts uh, in, uh, the, in, uh, in the uh, Indo-Pacific theater, not to contain China, but as the argument was done in the US to shape the environment around the rise of China so that the countries in the region, uh, in uh, ASEAN, South Asia, uh, had options other than giving in to Chinese preferences uh, and pressures. So that, that was uh, the argument that was put forward. Then there was a reaction that pivot was too strong a word. Uh, we don't want to signal to China that we are taking them on as a rival, uh, as an enemy, uh, that while we want to sort of shape the environment, uh, there is uh, scope for cooperation. So the word that was used was rebalance, that there would be a rebalance to Asia. And although they did took some measures in terms of uh, bringing uh, new arrangements for their military to access Australia, some facilities in Philippines, the kind of response that they uh, wanted to take, they were not able to take because of their continued involvement uh, and focus in Europe, because there they saw challenge from Russia in the context of Georgia, in the context of Ukraine, and continued instability and uh, challenges in West Asia. So that was something that was not carried out. And again, uh, when China militarized uh, the features in South China Sea, the US did not come forward with any effective response. And allies and partners of the United States, uh, of course, noticed that. For example, on Senkaku also, while the US said that it stood by uh, its obligation to Japan in the context of defense arrangements, it did not support uh, Japan's claim on Senkaku itself. Similarly, it did not support Philippines' claim on uh, Scarborough. And, uh, and in response to Chinese militarization in South China Sea, the entire effort from the Obama administration was only to enforce freedom of navigation uh, and not really push back on what China had done. And when the question was asked uh, with senior officials in the US administration, that can you enforce freedom of navigation in a medium and longer term context if Chinese physical presence 
uh, is built up in that area. So that to that they really didn't have a response, but that was where they had uh, limited uh, what they were going to do. It was in that background that the Trump administration came in. And if you notice in the first phase of the Trump administration, uh, really till the end of 2017, there was a bit of flip-flop in the approach to China. During the campaign, Trump had repeatedly uh, said that he would take strong action against China, that he would try and reduce the trade imbalance with China, he would raise uh, tariffs on supplies from China, he would declare China as a currency manipulator on day one, which is something they didn't do then, they did a little later for a while. But once he came into administration, uh, the message was that he could build a new relationship with President Xi, he could have elements of cooperation, uh, also in the context of North Korea, he invited Xi to Mar-a-Lago, uh, he visited China uh, towards the end of that year. But by December 2017, I think they assessed that the kind of cooperation they wanted from China, they were not getting, uh, their political requirements related to trade uh, were not being met. And so in the national security strategy uh, that came out in December uh, 17, for the first time, it was said clearly that China was a strategic rival. And it was among the main global competitors of and rivals of the US along with uh, Russia. And then of course, they went on to mention Iran, North Korea, and the challenge related uh, to non-state actors uh, and terrorism. This articulation was followed by subsequent US policy documents, the National Defense Strategy, uh, early next in 2018, the Nuclear Posture Review. Since that time, I think there has been a consistent, what one can call whole of government approach in the US, classifying China differently. There were statements by the Secretary of State on a number of occasions, the Vice President, the National Security Advisor, the Director of FBI, Attorney General, everyone consistently projecting that China was a main rival, that Chinese authoritarian uh, system was a, was a challenge to the US-led democratic uh, framework, and that this was a challenge that the United States needed to meet. Aside from the whole of um, uh, government approach, there was also an attempt of what I described uh, in the piece today as a whole of society approach, that they realized that through the period of engagement with China, uh, different, there were now different stakeholders in the US system were heavily invested in the China relationship. The US educational institution, uh, the regional uh, administration, the US businesses. So consistently there were messages directed, focused at uh, the US universities, the governors, uh, the US business that you need to change how you are engaging uh, with China uh, because uh, the Chinese practices are a long-term uh, challenge to the United States. And of course, uh, there were elements in the US administration uh, who were uh, not quite in sync with this. According to reports, uh, Jared Kushner, the advisor and son-in-law President Trump who supported engagement, continued engagement with China, as did uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Mnuchin. Henry Kissinger was widely reported as among those heavily involved in uh, behind the scenes lobbying to keep the process with China going as it was um, in the past. But broadly, this, this was the attempt. And it was in this background that a series of measures uh, were taken, which were unprecedented. Uh, the uh, sanctions were imposed on Chinese uh, technology companies to prevent access to technology, Huawei, ZTE. Sanctions were imposed on Chinese companies linked to the military because there was an argument that there is civil military fusion in China. And therefore, even civilian companies in China uh, having access to high technology then goes, feeds into the Chinese military, which is a challenge to the United States and that the state-owned enterprises are heavily entwined uh, with the Chinese state and system, and therefore they needed to be handled uh, differently. Uh, there were sanctions imposed on Chinese companies that were involved in construction activity in South China Sea. Sanctions on individuals uh, involved in uh, what were uh, described as human rights violations in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang, uh, and now of course declaring what has happened in Xinjiang um, as a genocide. And then, uh, now preventing many Chinese companies from becoming part of uh, stock indices uh, so that 
there is no automatic flow of funds uh, to those companies and many from being listed on the uh, various uh, stock exchanges in the United States. So a whole series of steps were now taken uh, against China, uh, which is very different. And I think when you spoke to um, policymakers, analysts, uh, and others in the US, the argument was that it is not so much the United States that has changed, but that China has changed. That under President Xi, China has taken a different path. The hide and bide uh, policy of Deng has been uh, given up. China is asserting itself. It is becoming unilateral in its assertions, in its uh, preferences. Uh, it is um, the, the China dream uh, uh, and others. Uh, so with that, U.S. interests are being directly challenged, and therefore the U.S. has no uh, option but to respond to this. Now, in that framework, I think uh, China in the United States has become a major political issue. Many of those who are going to be campaigning in 2024 for the president's uh, post, and in the U.S., as you know, before you finish one election, the campaign for the next one begins, will be marketing themselves based on a hawkish China policy. And if Trump uh, is able to uh, come back to campaign in 2024, that will certainly be an argument. But uh, somebody like Pompeo, uh, if you see the manner in which he has built up his profile as a, uh, as a China hawk, is something that he will use, aside from the other elements he has built in terms of uh, issues related to religious freedom, issues related to Israel. Uh, so that will be something that uh, he will be using. And therefore, uh, for Democrats, it is important at this stage to signal that they are no less hawkish on China than what was there in the uh, Trump administration. Furthermore, uh, Biden will need a measure of bipartisan consensus in the US Congress, both in the House and the Senate, where in the Senate is a one seat uh, margin, in the House also a reduced uh, margin although they are in a majority. So he needs some bipartisan consensus to get through the House and Senate measures that he wants related to the economy, related to infrastructure construction, related to stimulus. And for that, China will be an important peg that we need to compete with China. China is a rival for the United States and we need to work keeping that in mind. That again will generate uh, some compulsion to retain uh, the strong uh, posture and hawkish posture related to China. So given this um, and the fact that a Biden administration would like to signal that they are different from the Trump administration and that uh, they are more effective than the Trump administration, I think what they will do is perhaps the rhetoric uh, will come down. Uh, the unpredictability also uh, will come down. Uh, they would want to work at least show that they are working more with their allies and partners, which may temper um, some of the more harsh measures they want to do, especially if they want to carry Europe with them. Because as many have described, Europe doesn't really have a consolidated China policy. Uh, and there are differences in approach there. Germany is heavily invested uh, in China. Uh, five million German cars are sold to China every year, a million to the United States. The public opinion polls suggest in Germany that as many Germans believed uh, China to be the most important relationship as the uh, United States. So, so China has made inroads uh, in Europe and recently uh, the European Union and China have done uh, the investment agreement. So that might generate some constraint on the administration in terms of what they want to do. But of course, they're able to bring their allies with them. Uh, they would be more uh, effective in their approach. So. Given that, I think as far as the implications for India are concerned, uh, the US uh, and uh, Tony Blinken has mentioned that um, uh, in the hearing, he has also mentioned it in an important discussion he did at the Hudson Institute in 2020, that the United States will continue to build the relationship uh, with India as a major defense partner and sees India as a stabilizing force uh, in the region, and that a very uh, important uh, strategic partnership to build going ahead. So let me stop here, Ashok, and if there are any issues I've left out, I'd be happy to pick on that uh, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Arun, for that you know, very perceptive uh, and comprehensive uh, elaboration on how US-China relations have developed over the years. I think it's very important to remember 
and keep in mind the, the context and historical background of evolution, this relationship, how for an extended period, the USA was supportive of the rise of China and gradually this concerns developed and this uh, view became preponderant in the US system that China is a challenge uh, rather than an advantage when it comes to US, uh, US position in the world. You also brought out uh, the changes that occurred during uh, Trump presidency and how you, in your, it's your expectation that uh, due to a variety of reasons uh, in Biden administration to uh, relatively hawkish postures vis-a-vis -vis China will continue. And you have brought out some very important implications that uh, evolving US-China relations have for India and our own interests. Thanks for that presentation. I'll now turn to our second speaker, Anant Krishnan, China correspondent to Hindu. Uh, Anant, uh, as you know, has an outstanding track record of reporting from China for nearly a decade uh, for the Hindu and India today. He has recently published uh, an excellent book, India's China Challenge, uh, which we had discussed at this forum uh, a few weeks ago. So Anant, uh, over to you. Anant will be talking about how China is looking at Sino-US relations and some of the implications that this relationship has for India-China relations. Anant, over to you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Kant and uh, Ambassador Singh. It was, I think was really, I learned a lot from what you just said. Uh, what I thought I would do is uh, try and present some of the perspectives that uh, we've been seeing from China, from its officials, uh, its strategic community and state media over the past few days and weeks. I think Ambassador Kanta pretty much summed it up in two sentences at the introduction, which is an expectation that if things may be somewhat smoother and the relationship might be more institutional or through institutional channels, slightly more predictable, there are still longer term trends uh, that aren't uh, related to Trump or one party in the US and that there's a bilateral, there's a bipartisan consensus in America. I think that uh, people in China aren't in denial about that, but I thought it would be useful to just tease out some of the more interesting, colorful uh, views that have uh, come out in the Chinese press uh, over the last few weeks. Um, and also, of course, try and towards the end, make sense of how China views relations with India at the moment um, and how it fits into all of this. I thought I'll begin by uh, flagging your attention to two recent commentaries uh, out in the past week that were issued by uh, Xinhua News Agency, which is uh, the most official authoritative news outlet that you have in China. These are both first issued in Mandarin and then in English and were quite widely published across different Chinese media outlets. Uh, Xinhua doesn't often issue commentaries um, and uh, usually those that it does uh, are op-eds by writers. Both of these commentaries didn't have bylines uh, well, one didn't have a by byline, the other had a pseudonym. And what I found interesting was uh, the, some of the talking points uh, that they mentioned uh, had been sort of repeated by the Chinese foreign ministry all of this week, uh, leaving one to conclude that this is a message from fairly high up within the system. Uh, the first commentary was simply headlined, Good riddance, Mr. Trump. Um, its first sentence read, speaking about one of the many end of term moves that we have seen, uh, in this case, the sanctioning of six Chinese officials over Hong Kong. Uh, it called it the final scene of a preposterous show and saying that there was no limit on the ignorance and prejudice uh, of the Trump administration in looking to contain China's development. Uh, it went on to say that Trump's trade war had failed to boost the US economy it hurt the U.S. economy and as well as job losses in the U.S. And it pretty much said that uh, in their view, uh, the U.S. had, quote, clearly overestimated its ability uh, to influence the course of the relationship. It interestingly ended with an olive branch, uh, presumably to the next administration, saying that both sides were actually in a good position to help each other succeed and cooperate uh, in a lot of areas, starting with the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and the threat of nuclear proliferation, three issues that uh, were highlighted quite clearly. And then it concluded, quote, good riddance to the current administration and its final madness. 
The second uh, longer commentary was was somewhat more measured, uh, saying that uh, the relationship now, quote, uh, stood at a crossroads, uh, fraught with risks and challenges as well as opportunities. I look back on the 50th anniversary of uh, Kissinger's trip to China, uh, and it noted how trade had grown in excess of $500 billion, uh, and that there were something like 72,000 US companies that were based in China. Uh, with assets exceeding 700 billion US dollars. Uh, it noted that, however, the past four years, in their view, were the most difficult period since the establishment of diplomatic relations. And this they attributed to, quote, extreme anti-China forces in the US. Referring to the Trump administration, uh, it accused them of deliberately negating the history of bilateral relations and maliciously attacking the Communist Party of China. Uh, their main grouse was the move towards decoupling between the two economies and, in their view, coercing other countries into containing and confronting China in an attempt to create, quote, parallel worlds or two systems. I thought it was quite interesting uh, that it said that if the relationship had to return to some kind of normalcy or some track of engagement, that it, it laid down what would be a fundamental principle and a bottom line. Now, this fundamental principle in their view, and this is the Xinhua view, and as I said, there is reason to uh, conclude this came from somewhere fairly high up within the system, uh, was that to acknowledge both sides followed different social political systems, uh, to acknowledge that China had no intention of changing the US or replacing it, while the US should at the same time uh, abandon its wishful thinking of changing China. Uh, the bottom line from China's view was the U.S. should acknowledge that the CPC is the ruling party of China. Uh, and it said that it did make an interesting proposal that both sides and the new administration should begin working on what it called the cooperation framework. Uh, it said that this framework uh, could not be agreed on overnight, but it could focus on three areas, which it described as COVID-19, climate change, as well as stabilizing economic and trade relations. It's also interesting that a lot of uh, Chinese commentators have noted that where China might have some leverage uh, is in the Biden administration's emphasis on climate change. Uh, he has said that he would return to the Paris Agreement on day one. Uh, in addition to climate change, they look at the Iranian nuclear issue and the Korean Peninsula nuclear issue as two other areas where they feel that if the US wants to adopt a different approach, it will need China. And so this is going to result in at least three areas where both will at least have some dialogue as opposed to the last two, three years where there was an almost complete breakdown. So you see uh, sort of the outlines of, uh, of talking points emerging as, as the administration changes and Foreign Minister Wang Yi made pretty much the exact same points in an interview with the Chinese state media um, right after the new year. So what he said was, uh, he did make the same point that the relationship was facing its biggest challenge uh, since the normalization of ties. And he said, obviously, quote, it all comes down to the misconceptions of US poly policymakers about China. So there is some mirror imaging here. Ambassador Singh said the view in the US is the US approach hadn't changed, but China under Xi had changed. Well, here they're pretty much saying the, saying the exact same thing that it was a change in US attitudes to China that had led to what has happened over the last four years. And in their view, uh, this is Wang Yi's view, it was the US attempt to suppress China's rise and start a new Cold War uh, that was at the root of the tensions. Wang Yi also did offer an olive branch saying that uh, relations are now at a crossroads and in his view, quote, there was a new window of hope uh, he said that China hoped the next administration would return to, quote, a sensible approach and resume dialogue. Uh, but of course, uh, left unsaid is what China would agree. And so far, what they've been saying so far is that one party that uh, was responsible for all the problems should be the one to fix it. Uh, and the Chinese saying that's been quoted a lot in the last few weeks is that uh, who, he who ties the knot should undo the knot. So they've made it very clear that they don't feel they have any responsibility in all of this. Uh, I think that uh, the immediate challenge, obviously, that the relationship faces in the view of these voices in Beijing is that the Biden administration has a lot of things that it has to undo. 
um, the U.S. website Axios yesterday had a had an, an excellent piece where it had actually noted every single action taken by the Trump administration uh, aimed at China. They listed 210 public actions related to China, spanning 10 U.S. departments. Um, this is far beyond just State Department and Department of Defense. Uh, and this is what they call the quote, whole of government strategy. I think this was before the listing of, of genocide in Xinjiang, which would make it 211 actions. I don't think there's an expectation in China that a Biden administration would overturn all of these or even that he chooses to. But there is an expectation that, uh, that he has to at least take actions on some of these uh, to show his goodwill. Whether that happens or not remains to be seen. As Ambassador Singh said, I think uh, a lot of uh, the members of Team Biden taking shape have made it clear that this isn't going to be a return to uh, Obama uh, one. This is not going to be an Obama 2.0 and that they do agree with many of the fundamental uh, premises of how Trump viewed China as the biggest strategic challenge. A few views that I thought I would share uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Diao Daming, who is a China-US expert at Renmin University in Beijing, I think shared what I think is the common view that Democrats have also accepted in his words, the fundamental stance of great power competition laid by the Republicans. So in his view, they can only make tactical level adjustments and the basic course of relations would not change. His concern and the concern of many others in Beijing is that the Democrats would be more effective in quote, pressuring China through multilateral approaches working more closely with US allies and being more concerned about ideological differences in human rights uh, on Xinjiang, on Tibet and Hong Kong, where the Democratic Party has been outspoken. Uh, Joe Biden was ahead of the Trump administration as a candidate. He said what was happening in Xinjiang was genocide. And so they feel that, uh, and obviously even if the US State Department under Trump was outspoken on Xinjiang, uh, it's been documented that uh, Mr. Trump himself praised what China was doing in Xinjiang to President Xi and said that they should continue what they were doing. Uh, they are also concerned that uh, Biden could revive Obama's legacy on trade, uh, on a return to multilateral trading arrangements, which they feel would hurt China's interests. I think uh, the view was summed up quite nicely by Li Haidong, who is a professor in China Foreign Affairs University. Uh, he said that Biden is, quote, definitely smoother to deal with. Uh, and so China can expect smoother communication and more effective communication. But it remains to be seen in his view if Biden will choose to fix the damage caused by Trump. But at the very least, they would have more reason to dialogue and cooperate at least on climate change, Iran, and North Korea. At the same time, the view that he outlines, which is, a, I think, a very common view in China right now, is that China should insist to its non-negotiable bottom line when it comes to U.S. interference in its internal affairs, and that that should be a fundamental point if they're looking to rebuild the relationship. That is what it should be rebuilt on, in the Chinese view. That was also a point made by Xi Jinping recently on the anniversary of the Korean War, he did not name the US, but he did say that China was now in a position where it would fight back and the Chinese people would not be trifled with. So that's the mood right now. And I don't think that's going to change uh, regardless of who is in the White House. Uh, I will wrap up with this interesting observation um, from Wei Zongyu at Fudan who had uh, an essay on three things that will change and four things, three things that will not change and four things that will. The three things that will not change in his view is the tough on China rhetoric, which in his view is the new political correctness in the United States. Uh, and in his view, no one wants to be seen as being soft on China and they would risk losing public support. Uh, the second thing that wouldn't change is the partial technological decoupling that would continue, as well as the difficult environment for Chinese firms in the US. Third, uh, they would expect a continued, a continued toughness from America on human rights uh, and possibly more so, including in his view, an international united front against China on democracy and human rights issues. I think the Biden administration has said that they are going to organize a global conference on democracy. Four things that could change. 
Uh, the first is he feels that unlike the Republican Party, the, the Democrats haven't really fleshed out what the China challenge is. Um, they think that uh, in his view, they don't think the China challenge is primarily a military one. Uh, second, they think his approach would be different uh, and in some ways could be more effective than Trump because he would uh, engage with China without resorting to, quote, self-defeating unilateral actions. I think the third uh, area where they feel change is improvement when it comes to bilateral, cultural, people-to-people -people exchanges uh, that have come to a near halt. Uh, the Trump administration has cracked down on Chinese students, uh, on Chinese journalists, and they believe that at least some of those uh, traditional forms of uh, engagement will continue. And lastly, they feel that there will be opportunity to cooperate on global issues beyond the bilateral like climate change and non-proliferation. So I think a common theme. I think one final note, um, I think when we focus on the bilateral calculus and all the damage that China has, all the hurt that the Chinese economy has faced uh, under Donald Trump, uh, one thing that hasn't been lost on the Chinese state media is Trump has been at least one kind of a gift in terms of a propaganda gift, uh, which is why that uh, one of the nicknames that you see in the Chinese media is uh, referring to Trump as Chuan Zheng Wo, meaning Trump who builds China. The argument being that a divisive America, a divided America was good for China. Uh, it was not a great advertisement uh, for a democratic political system. This was a point that has been milked ceaselessly by the Communist Party's propaganda outfits. Uh, and that's something that clearly uh, China is going to miss uh, when, when they deal with the next administration. A final uh, few thoughts on observations on the China-India front. I think I'll leave this as a few observations that perhaps we can discuss as a Q&A. So the conventional wisdom, I think, uh, prior to 2020 was that with Trump, with rising US-China tensions, all this would be good for India. Uh, there would be greater space for India. And the thinking was that this would incentivize China to keep relations with India stable. If we go back to 2017 and 2018, I was looking back at some of the briefings we had back then with Indian and Chinese officials. And this was the background to everything that happened in the lead up to uh, the Wuhan summit. Um, you had this new phrase in the relationship was that India and China could be quote, a factor of stability. The relationship could be a factor of stability. All this was a nod of course to Trump and the instability in Washington. Uh, the now declassified 2018 Indo-Pacific strategy, which is quite interesting expresses the concern that China would try to divide US partners and allies. Yet instead, what we've seen is something very different. And I think the events of last year underline that, uh, that in the midst of tensions with the US, you're seeing China take a harder line on issues like Taiwan, South China Sea, or even India. So it's worth asking if we should revisit uh, some of those notions that we had from four years ago. I think the second interesting point is the degree to which Chinese experts in the media have explained the breakdown in India-China relations against the backdrop of the breakdown in China-US relations. Um, there was this great interview uh, with Liu Zhongyi of the Shanghai Institute of International Studies in September, which uh, Hemant Adlaka of ICS had translated and I recommend reading. Uh, and he's done a great service by translating that, which I think really captured the semi-official narrative in China explaining the breakdown in China-India relations. And a lot of it centered around India-US relations. So I think uh, I would recommend reading all of it, but I would just flag a couple of points that he made, uh, which was that he felt that the key to resolving the problem in China-India relations was for China to quote, accurately determine its stance uh, and have a better handle of what India and the US were doing. Uh, he felt that the reaction of the US to the boundary clash of 2020 uh, underlined the fact that in his view, uh, India and the US were gravitating towards, quote, a de facto alliance, even if it would never be acknowledged. And he called for this to reassess fundamentally uh, China's understanding of this three-way dynamic. Uh, and I don't think that's going to change going forward, even with the new administration. Thirdly, uh, the other interesting point has been a little bit of mirror imaging in India 
viewing China as fundamentally voiding uh, the boundary agreements that have kept the peace uh, for the last 28 years or so. Uh, China has pretty much been accusing India of doing the same thing, which is uh, violating another fundamental agreement, which was the quote, proposition of the boundary question vis-a-vis -vis the entire relationship. So what they have been focusing on is not China's aggression on the LAC, but India's economic measures, uh, going back to withdrawal from RCEP negotiations to the FDI amendments in April prior to the boundary clash, all of which is in their view, suggesting that there was a partial aim at, aim at decoupling from India, which was in sync with what the US was doing. So in their view, uh, that the main pressure, uh, as Liu Zhongyi put it in his interview, was that the India and the US were presenting a joint challenge to China, which they had to respond to. And I don't think there's anything to suggest that that, that logic is going to change uh, in the coming year ahead. I think I'll wrap up with those observations and hand it back to Ambassador Kant. Maybe we could get into the Q&A on some of those issues. Thank you, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, I'd unfortunately dropped out due to connectivity issues. I missed part of your presentation. I just managed to return a few minutes ago. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. And the way you brought out, you know, how China is looking at USA, illustrating with the comments uh, given by various Chinese experts and commentators, uh, and also implications that uh, developments in uh, US-China relations have for India-China relations. Thanks for that presentation. I'm sure there are a lot of questions as we move ahead. So we had uh, two excellent presentations by Ambassador Arun Singh and by Anand Krishnan. So now the floor is open for the uh, Q&A and discussion. Uh, we already have some people who have indicated their interest in asking questions. I'll request others to flag their interest, either by raising hand, uh, using the raise hand option or by just indicating in the chat box. I'll begin with, I'll begin by you know, identifying three persons who have shown interest. One, uh, Prof. Samant Adlaka, uh, two, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, three, Ambassador Yogendra Kumar in that order. Let me begin by, by asking Hemant to ask his question. Hemant. Um, thank you, Ambassador Kanta. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not putting on my video because of very bad connectivity here. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah, that's why actually I wrote my question and sent to the chat box. Anyway, uh, basically, uh, uh, my first, I wish to congratulate both the speakers and of course, you for giving a very comprehensive introduction to the team. Uh, my question basically is comparing the two documents which have uh, uh, larger implications for the next four years under the Biden presidency, both for uh, China-US relations and also for India, especially in the context of Indo-Pacific. And when we compare the just declassified uh, 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 SSFIP, that is the uh, Strategic Framework for Indo-Pacific, uh, and the which was declassified on the 12th of January, and comparing it with the uh, two 2019 document, uh, which was released by or formulated by the Department of Defense, uh, IPSR. I mean, there are a lot of conflicting uh, uh, points in the two documents, especially when we look at the focus on the Indo-Pacific uh, and also therefore India. So just two conflicting uh, points I pointed out in my question. One is uh, between China and uh, Soviet uh, Russia, which was also referred to by Ambassador Arun Singh uh, uh, in passing. And the confusion this creates is that for the Biden administration, what is going to be the main challenge when it comes to foreign policy? Is it Russia or is it China? Because both the documents uh, put emphasis on, one puts it on Russia and the other puts it on China. 
and uh, the other conflicting point is on uh, the india as the ally partner uh, the one documents uh, document puts uh, south korea in the center as the allies in the asia pacific and relegates india to the other smaller countries along with south asia and uh, uh, so uh, i mean i just would like to know your comments whether this conflicting uh, focus is the result of the confusion in the so called bipartisan view in the us or is it the uh, uh, continuing rivalry between the two parties which is going to have its major impact on the priorities between who will be calling the shots when it comes to foreign policy white house or the uh, pentagon your comments please arun would like to respond yeah so i think let me respond on that uh i think there is a general sense uh, both among democrats uh, and republicans that uh, while both russia and china are major challenges to the us it is china which is the growing challenge uh, you may recall that in 2012 uh, during the election at that time when mitt romney uh, who was uh, the republican rival to president obama had uh, said that russia is uh, the main uh, strategic rival for the us and president obama in the campaign then said that russia is a regional power it is not a global power and of course once russia was seen as having intervened uh, in the 2016 election um, you know there was some criticism of obama at that time but i think there is a general sense that russia is certainly a military challenge uh, but um, in the wider us system uh, they see china as a broader systemic challenge today to what the us is attempting because they see russia challenge uh, although russia is active to some extent in west asia is active in africa they see russia challenge as focused largely on europe and they see growing european capacity to respond to that but it is in the china challenge which is uh, appearing in latin america appearing in africa it is appearing of course uh, in uh, in uh, asia uh, and uh, also in europe uh, directly because china is reaching europe through the arctic through cyber Uh, through its uh, ownership of ports and other infrastructure there so they see china as uh, the main uh, global challenge to them uh, also in the economic and technological domain and i think that is certainly going uh, to condition uh, the wider response second um, you know when you spoke about whether it's india or arok look i think in the us um, articulation uh, clearly ROK Japan Australia are at a different position because they are formal allies so when they are looking at certain military postures they would be describing uh, these countries differently from what they describe india and they see uh, the convergence in the interest with india they describe india as a major defense partner uh, there are more and more military exercises being done with india because as us officials have pointed out that the us does more military exercises to uh, today with india than with any other country uh, outside uh, the nato uh, framework uh, and so so they look at the relationship with it in that context and they also talk more and more of uh, interoperability uh, with india but as far as a formal military alliance is concerned uh, clearly india is not uh, what rok japan and australia mean to the united states so i think um, we should not really look at uh, a country specific uh, competition uh, in terms of how relationships are described or articulated but i think there is a recognition in the us system that to effectively shape the environment around the rise china they need to build a stronger partnership with a country of india size and capacity and the other countries in uh, asia will not quite uh, provide the same capacity Just to add one uh, small point uh, to that, uh, Hemant, I would point you to uh, what the, the new Secretary of Defense, uh, Lloyd Austin, said is, is in his uh, hearings today. It's quite interesting. He was asked the question that you just asked us, and uh, he said that he broadly agrees with the the Trump administration's characterization of both China and Russia uh, as rivals and the big challenges. But he said very clearly that, as I see it, China is. the top priority and he put it in black and white just i thought i'd flag that to your attention 
Thank you. Uh, uh, Vishnu, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, will you, would you like to ask your question now? Thank you very much, Chair. Am I audible? Yes. All right. I, uh, Arun and Anand, thank you for uh, wonderful insights that you have given. Arun, you mentioned you were speak. You spoke briefly about the South China Sea and uh, uh, how Obama did did not walk the talk. Uh, from either of the two speakers, uh, do you have any in, any comments or uh, insights into why did Obama? Uh, just wag the finger when uh, Chinese took over the Scarborough Shoal because that was a turning point as far as I can see it. And after that, they went uh, whole steam ahead. So what could have been the constraints? Uh, that's one. Two very uh, quick, short questions. Um, the, there were reports early on in April, May this uh, last year that the US government had been funding uh, some research at Wuhan lab on coronavirus. And uh, then uh, things quietened down. Uh, is there anything more to that or it was just a part of the conspiracy theory? Uh, because apparently some experiments on bats, et cetera, et cetera, were done. Lastly, uh, there, were, there are reports that uh, Trump's efforts to wean American companies out of uh, China have failed or decoupling has failed and barely 17 to 18% of the American firms factories are either leaving or planning to leave. Is, is that correct? Thank you. So Ashok, if uh, I may start by responding yeah, to that. Yeah. Yes. So on, uh, uh, you know, Vishnu, um, uh, as we've discussed and as we all recognize, that every country takes action based on its own compulsion and interests. And therefore, the US response based was based on how they saw their interest. And I think they assessed that um, given relative capacities, it was not in their interest to take on China frontally on that issue. And that their interest lay uh, more in asserting freedom of navigation, uh, in uh, uh, sort of reiterating their defense commitment uh, to the Philippines, but not go beyond that and not take on China frankly, because that would have involved them uh, in a different level of engagement. And they made the determination that that uh, uh, didn't work for them. And that was similar in the case of Senkaku, a similar response in the case of Chinese uh, militarization. So I think that's a limit. We have to understand that uh, despite the US being the preeminent global power now being challenged by uh, also by China, uh, there are limits to what the US can do. And there are limits to what the US uh, political um, and the military system uh, is capable of achieving uh, on any particular issue. On the Not Wuhan lab issue, you know, I don't think there have been consistent uh, follow up uh, reporting on that. Uh, but uh, you may have also seen that there was a professor in Harvard, uh, Charles Lindbergh, I think, who was uh, arrested. Uh, for cooperating uh, with facilities in Wuhan, uh, Professor of Chemistry, uh, and uh, without appropriate approvals uh, from the uh, US government. Uh, so, yeah, but on the, in terms of the related to bats, I have not seen any consistent uh, reporting that would see the issue through. Uh, in terms of the US companies, you're right. I think uh, most US companies have assessed that despite the friction, despite the challenges, they're still in a position to make sufficient profits in China uh, to stay on. Uh, in terms of reporting that I've seen, uh, they have also got back to the administration to say that, look, it was the US government that encouraged all of us to get involved in China. And now we can't suddenly do a 180 degree turn and there we have investments, we have stakes, but most of the companies are looking at China plus options because they see that now there are enhanced risks in terms of continued engagement. Uh, and so they're looking at investment also elsewhere uh, to balance out the risk. And I think um, because of this increased uncertainty, when they're looking at fresh investment proposals, they are quite, not quite rushing into China the same way as they did before. 
At the same time, uh, again, reports have indicated that the Chinese government is reaching out to the U.S. companies to say that we will be helpful to you. We will be accommodating of your interests and concerns and continue to remain engaged here. So that's, that's the other thing. And in the phase one trade deal that Trump did in January last year, um, the Chinese gave concessions uh, for financial companies in the U.S., and even as the administration has been pushing for some decoupling from China, companies based on Wall Street, the US financial companies have been pushing for continued engagement. And the Chinese have tried to attract them in. And again, the investment agreement that Europe has done, uh, part of the Chinese effort is uh, to reach out to as many companies as they can, uh, as the Chinese can, and show them that they continue to benefit from engagement with China. So their strategy would be certainly uh, to divide between Europe and US and in the US to divide different stakeholders. And I think a reference has been made to climate change with somebody like uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry being given a ministerial status, a seat at the National Security Council and his mandate being climate change. He will certainly push for engagement with China on climate change issues as being an important uh, uh, reason for keeping the door open to China. So I think these different pulls and pressures will play out and, and we'll have administration navigates all this. Thank you. Uh, Anant would like to add something? Yes, um, on, the, on the decoupling uh, issue, I think that uh, the two numbers that I saw in the, in the last couple of days that I thought really showed uh, how limited uh, the Trump administration has been in, in its objectives. I think where it did succeed was in really uh, dealing a blow to Chinese firms in terms of their access to US technology. But uh, uh, HSBC surveyed uh, 1,100 global companies, 70% of which were American. And they found that 75% of them uh, over the next two years plan to increase their supply chain footprint in China. So in terms of relocating supply chains that really hasn't panned out, uh, neither has the trade deficit uh, the numbers that just came out uh, recently uh, put it at $317 billion uh, between, in China's favor, which is higher than the, the $288 billion that it was at the end of the year one of the Trump administration. So after four years, it's actually increased. Although, uh, Anand, I, the figure that I saw uh, between 2019 and 2020 till November, January, November, there is a reduction of $37 billion in the trade deficit. That's the U.S. Uh, Bureau, uh, Bureau of Census, U.S. Census Bureau's figures. Just, just. So yeah, I suppose we'll wait to see when their updated figures come out. Uh, but uh, these, according to the Chinese figures, it was more or less the same, and there hasn't been really a big difference. Uh, the Wuhan lab is quite interesting. I think, as you said, uh, there's been a history of I think U.S. scientists have been cooperating with Chinese scientists in studying bad coronaviruses. I think my colleague, uh, my colleagues in the Hindu had this interesting story where they were even cooperating uh, with an institute in Bangalore, where you had this the one institute in American scientists and Indian scientists who were who were studying bad coronaviruses at some point of time in the Northeast. Uh, but that uh, that's a, that's a tangential thing. But what is interesting is I think the Trump administration has cut uh, the the funding for what was a NIH supported uh, research study into bad coronaviruses. But the U.S. scientists have been quite critical of that. And I read a comment where they said that you're, it's kind of like a blaming a fire and a fireman for a fire because they said that they've been studying these bad coronaviruses precisely because for the last 10 years, the scientific community felt that there was a pandemic that was going to come. And so that's why they were studying them. But now they say they're being blamed for it. So, but we never quite know. And I mean, you, you still can't rule out with any certainty uh, whether or not... Uh, this was a bad, I mean, the original source of this is something we'll never know, especially because China has been really guarded about opening up the, the Wuhan Institute. And I don't think they're going to open it up uh, to the WHO team that's currently in Wuhan either. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you, too. Can we now request Ambassador Yogendra Kumar to ask this question? Yogendra? Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, the statements made for the, at the time of the confirmation hearing, actually is not very much different from what the Trump officials did when they were actually doing their confirmation hearing. So I think we'll have to wait and see exactly how the policy unfolds as far as China is concerned. And the US, I mean, primary objective at the moment, of course, is coronavirus and to turbocharge the economy. And the Chinese have been a little clever in the sense that they have wrapped, they have wrapped up 
South, Southeast Asia and RCEP and also wrapped up European Union in terms of the agreement. So uh, my question actually here is that given, and, and of course the fact that at this particular moment, practically everybody's asking this question, to what extent the US leadership will be resolute enough to actually show that they are leaders uh, in many respects. And my question here basically is this, that uh, you know, in terms of uh, the kind of situation that is unfolding, to what extent will the US have an appetite, for example, for a standoff in South China Sea? You know, I mean, we know that later, late last year, there were, of course, uh, some standoff which took place in South China Sea. There's one question, which is of interest to us. The second thing, of course, is that given the fact that, you know, we are somewhat differently placed, to what extent does it open for us more options vis-a-vis -vis Russia? You know, in the, in, the, in the sense that, you know, there's also this question about the U.S. taking a certain hard line on Russia. Thank you. Arun would like to respond. Yeah, in terms of the standoff, uh, you know, I think um, uh, the Chinese uh, at one level have the option uh, to show some cooperation to the new administration uh, to change the atmospherics around their relationship. And therefore, they can offer them some cooperation, let's say climate change, North Korea, some other issue, uh, getting the global economy moving again, so which also benefits the US. That can be a peg. Uh, to lower the temperature a bit and, and uh, get some dialogues uh, going. At the same time, uh, historically, the Chinese have also tested incoming administrations. Um, so you may recall that in 2001 was the EP3 incident when an American uh, reconnaissance aircraft ended up having to land in Chinese territory at 24 USM and were kept there for a couple of weeks. In 2009, soon after the Obama administration came in, there was a near collision in the South China Sea. So they also do the testing to see uh, you know, the dynamic and will of the new administration. Uh, so you know, there could be some short-term uh, orientations, uh, short-term incidents, but I think uh, the wider acceptance in the US system is that they are under a challenge, a long-term challenge from China, and they need to respond to that. And I think the relationship will be uh, conditioned, keeping this in mind. And that, that's the message you get uh, across the board. On Russia, you know, uh, President Trump himself clearly wanted to have a more cooperative relationship with Russia. But it was the US Congress and, uh, uh, and, and not just Democrats, but also Republicans, but also because of the push from Democrats who tied down his hands uh, because of this uh, argument and perception that the Russia was involved in the 2016 uh, electoral campaign. Uh, Joe Biden may not have uh, the same sort of uh, uh, weakness that Trump had uh, in terms of political criticism of a link with Russia, but there is a lot of anger in the Democratic Party um, about how they see Russia's uh, approach, not just in the domestic US context, uh, but also in Ukraine. And that will uh, you know put some pressure on Biden and others uh, related to Katsa. Um, you may have noticed that uh, the Trump administration went ahead and sanctioned Turkey um, uh, for purchase of S-400. Uh, they have now sanctioned a couple of uh, Russian companies and vessels involved in construction of the Nord Stream 2 project um, uh, in Germany related to Katsa. And we'll have to see how does the Biden administration handle uh, Katsa requirement um, uh, for our own S-400 purchase. So Biden would not be under the same pressure uh, from the Congress. And we'll uh, obviously have to make the argument that it is in U.S. own interest not to signal in India that it is an unreliable partner and therefore it should not sanction India, recognizing India's historical uh, linkages and uh, national security interests. But that's something I think um, we'll have to see how it plays. Uh, Anand would like to add something? Uh, nothing to add. Okay. Uh, I'll now invite... Uh, Professor Anand Giri to ask his question. And uh, Anand, uh, now both of you have mainly taken a geopolitical position, but even uh, in the in the height of uh, you know anti-Soviet position in the US, there are different kind of people's movement. 
uh, so my query is that the discourse so far has been limited to geopolitical construction of the political establishment and there is no engagement with varieties of people's movement because a growing us china confrontation in the context of climate change and nuclear war is deeply implicated with varieties of concerns so i would request your attention to the emerging and existent people's movement for dialogue and peace in the usa and also in china however incipient it may be my second query is that ambassador singh and also anand krishnan i think you referred to the genocidal characterization of chinese policy vis a vis xinjiang but what is the implication of that and and also if you would reflect upon the whole question of tibet and and if there would be some change in the biden administration uh, vis a vis the tibetan question thank you uh, arun would like to come in first yeah let me come in on that so uh, in i think uh, it's a very important point related to what's happening in the wider stakeholder community uh, at the popular level uh, the movements how they are getting involved so far we have not seen too much activism on that front related to china the more uh, uh, sort of effort for continued engagement with positive orientation is coming from institutions and organizations that are benefiting Uh, financially from the china linkage um, and so you know as i mentioned earlier is the universities is the businesses is the regions where china is heavily invested and the chinese have been very aggressive they push you know companies organizations people to come out in support of china uh, the embassy reaches out gives the dicta demands certain things or um, cuts down uh, on the engagement in fact uh, uh, in the whole uh, series of speeches that uh, pompeo did not only did he in fact massachusetts institute of technology refused to host pompeo's speech directed at universities and then he went to georgia tech and uh, made the speech and specifically mentioned that massachusetts had refused uh, to allow me to uh, to speak there uh, they called out the us national basketball association uh, because they had criticized the manager of houston rockets uh, for silencing one of their officials who had uh, tweeted against chinese action uh, in uh, hong kong uh, uh, pompeo also criticized hollywood for refusing to be critical of chinese policies in any of the kind of films that they are making because there's heavy chinese investment uh, in the entertainment industry in the us so that kind of um, uh, sort of action uh, and pushback uh, is happening in terms of the um, characterization as genocide it can open up for further sanctions uh, from the us against uh, chinese officials involved and it can lead to us activism in multilateral fora uh, against china uh, because it's a very very serious uh, characterization of course china has shown capacity uh, to push back uh, against that um, uh, in the human rights council for example the us and 30 other countries came out with a statement criticizing chinese practices in xinjiang but china generated support from 50 countries including a large number of islamic countries Uh, who are supportive of china on the issue on tibet again i think there is a growing uh, demand in the us for being um, more proactive in terms of uh, defending uh, the cultural uh, other rights human rights uh, of the tibetan people but so far i have seen that coming uh, i mean outside the system of course but more from the us congress uh, rather than from the administration itself uh because trump didn't meet the dalai lama and uh, obama was also a little careful in handling that issue and uh, we'll have to see uh, the manner in which uh, joe biden decides to deal with this but the us congress has been pushing for that and in the latest national defense authorization act they brought in a specific uh, provision related to policy on tibet the kind of support us should provide and that the us should not recognize um uh, any dalai lama that is not generated by the tibetan uh, community but uh, you know selected uh, from beijing and i think the other thing we'll have to watch is on taiwan uh, because on taiwan the trump administration specifically has done far more than previous administration the, uh, the he spoke to the president of taiwan in december 2016 soon after he was elected uh, and the chinese reacted very negatively to that president she after that refused a call 
with Trump till he was prepared to say after the call that uh, uh, U.S. stood by uh, the earlier commitments um, related uh, to Taiwan and China. And uh, so once that was done, only then did he speak and the uh, uh, Trump administration was a little careful. But towards the last phase, they have authorized high level engagement. Uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary has uh, visited, they had authorized the uh, PR in the UN uh, to go to Taiwan, but that meeting uh, visit was cancelled. But Pompeo has formally authorized now um, uh, uh, higher level uh, diplomatic and official engagement between US and Taiwan. And we'll have to see how the Biden administration uh, deals with that. Uh, Anand would like to add something? Sure. Briefly, um, uh, as Ambassador Singh said, I think the, the on Xinjiang, uh, it will have uh, some impact in the sense that this is the first government that's actually termed it a genocide. So it could lead to other governments uh, coming out with stronger public statements on what's happening in Xinjiang, um, uh, possibly only in Europe. I think it will keep in place all the trade restrictions that have been put in on companies that have any presence in Xinjiang on imports that can be traced to Xinjiang. All of that will remain in place. And given that Biden has said on record as a candidate that he thinks it's genocide, uh, it will be very strange for him to to change that. And I think that will be here to stay. On the people's movements, I will just make a brief point where it's true that in the US, you have constituencies that have even publicly criticized the Trump administration. For instance, universities have come out at, at, at some restrictions on, on Chinese students. Uh, the business community can come out. But in China, you have to, I think, important to remember that it, it's, it, there's no space for other constituencies to publicly come out and shape policy in the way they can in the US. Ultimately, the, the leadership sets the policy and everybody falls in line. So I would say that there's not much space for, for uh, outside the state for influencing uh, the relationship as far as China is concerned would be my take. Thanks. Uh, we have in fact run out of time, but uh, I'll request uh, Admiral Murli Dharan and Ambassador Suresh Koel to ask their questions and keep the questions very brief because we have run out of time. Uh, mm -hmm. Admiral Murli Dharan. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Ashok. Uh, my question is primarily to Ambassador Arun Singh. You know, the, I'm just looking at the basic policy of US over the long term from what you have listed. Now, they propped up China, and China has sort of, you know, become the challenger gone against them. Similarly, if you recall, uh, to spite the Soviet Union, they propped up people like, you know, which grew up into things like Taliban, which came back to haunt the uh, you know, the U.S. itself. So in the long term, does U.S. really think long term or, and do they have a policy? Can they be trusted? And uh, my own question is also to, we mentioned, you mentioned Kissinger. In 71, you know, he supported the Pakistan and the China, the thing. He spoke against us. But in his later book, 2014 book, which has also been quoted by some of our people to say that he actually praised India's non-aligned policy in 2014 in his book, The Choices. So what is the dichotomy in the US thinking in the long term? Thank you. Uh, let's combine all the questions. So Suresh and then Prerna Gandhi. Uh, we'll, we'll conclude after that. Uh, thank you, Ashok. And uh, Suresh, just keep your question very brief. Yes, I know, I know. I, I was out of the room for about five minutes and therefore I do not know if my question has already been answered by the two speakers. But briefly, what I wanted to know is that in terms of working out a relationship with China uh, under the new administration, where do you think, primarily to Arun, uh, where do you think will be the possible adjustments that would be coming from the US administration uh, with China? And do you think Quad could be one of the areas where USA could change its policy or soften its policy. Thank you. I couldn't be briefer than that. <laughs> Thanks, Suresh. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Prerna, will you unmute yourself and ask the question? I think she has dropped out, Ashok. I don't see her in the... Okay, I'll, I'll just read out her questions the chat box. Uh, uh, what would be the impact on Taiwan of the change of leadership in US. The removal of restrictions on political exchanges with Taiwanese officials has the potential to create a new momentum if Biden encourages. I think Arun has uh, partly answered this question. 
So back to Arun and Anant. So I think the first question to Ashok was, does the US think long term? And my response is that the US thinks it is thinking long term. And you know, I, in my engagements in the US, uh, I used to say that they have tremendous resources. They have huge bureaucratic organizations and capacities. They have large numbers of think tanks. They issue every, uh, they study every issue in great detail. Many reports come out. If you look at, for example, various strategy reports that have come out or reports related to Indo-Pacific, whole series of things, including the administration. And yet, how is it that at the end of it, they make serious mistakes? I mean, look at what the support to Taliban, uh, to uh, jihadi elements against the Soviet Union led to. It led to the Al-Qaeda attack. Their intervention in Iraq in 2003 didn't succeed um, at all. Uh, so I think uh, while the US does examine and look at various issues, the final policy choices that are made are made based on political compulsions. And we have to factor that in. And that applies to every country. And therefore, the compulsions of that moment, what you need to do, that very often determine uh, your policy. And it can have uh, longer term consequences uh, that you ignore at that time or you're not able to anticipate. And um, even a country with resources like the US does end up with that. And we've seen, for example, on their policy to China, something that they are acknowledging now. But at that time, they felt that in the global balance of power, it was important to get China on their side, uh, to split it off from the Soviet Union. And after the end of the Cold War, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, they felt that through engagement, they could condition the shape of China's rise, which would work in US interests. And it didn't work out that way. In terms of Suresh's question, uh, I would feel that um, uh, if China is able to give uh, some cooperation to the US in areas that matter to it, like climate change or let's say North Korea, uh, the US may relax a bit on economic and technology uh, access issues, but I don't think they're going to relax uh, or, or go back on, for example, the Quad or the Indo-Pacific. In fact, there was a lot of speculation going on. Uh, whether the US would not pursue these policies as uh, sort of uh, uh, energetically as the Trump administration had done. But if you saw the comments, not just before the campaign, but also um, during the hearing yesterday, the Indo-Pacific was mentioned repeatedly as an important framework uh, for cooperation and support to the Quad and, and uh, strategic cooperation, defense cooperation, also in the framework of the Quad was specifically articulated by the incoming defense secretary. So I don't see any uh, give on that. Again, I think on Taiwan, uh, I would believe that the effort on the part of the Trump, of the Biden administration would be uh, to avoid the kind of provocation on this issue that the Trump administration has done. And if without uh, sort of being seen as going back, if they can find a way of not uh, pursuing uh, actively uh, the, the space that Pompeo has opened uh, through his uh, decision, uh, they would pr probably not want to use this as, uh, as a provocation for China. Uh, Anant? Nothing to add, Ambassador Khan, to Ambassador Singh's detailed reply. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, we will uh, conclude now. We have already run out of time. So I will not try to sum up a very rich discussion we had. Let me join other colleagues in uh, thanking and congratulating the two speakers for excellent work they did. Both you know, Arun and Anant, their presentations were, were really remarkable, very insightful. And we have uh, a much better understanding of dynamics of US-China relations under Biden administration. Uh, one thing uh, comes across uh, from presentations and remarks made by Ambassador Arun Singh and, and Anand Krishnan that uh, one may expect uh, a fairly large measure of continuity when it comes to Sino-US relations. Uh, in the recent past, this relationship has been characterized by strategic contention. That element of rivalry uh, will not go away. Uh, there might be greater effort made by the Biden administration to explore areas of convergence on issues like uh, uh, pandemic uh, or, or you know, climate change or you know, global economic uh, issues. Uh, 
that might lead to you know usa and china working together on specific issues that might lead to style of of uh, diplomacy which is little less confrontational a little more predictable but the basic dynamics of this relationship to my mind is unlikely to change anytime soon so thank you very much uh, for the, the presentation let me thank the two speakers again and thank all of you for joining us in this discussion this is a dialogue which will continue because it's a relationship which has very major implications for us uh, in terms of our national interests in terms of our own relations india's relations with both the usa and china so we'll continue this dialogue in future seminars of institute of chinese